So my talk today, as the title on the screen suggests, I'm going to be thinking about topics of diaspora, belonging, inclusion, research, and colonialism through an oral history project on queer and trans six. As a faith-based minority in a Southern Asian context, somewhere along the lines of differentially racialized minorities in the U.S. context, and technically gender and sexual minorities in a global context, queer and trans six are a special set of communities. I am a little biased by that, of course. Um, I believe that by taking questions of doing research, ethical research, with queer and trans six seriously, we can get a clearer idea of and a more comprehensive understanding of what I'm calling the colonial marginalization of gender, sexuality, and faith in the United States. My phrasing is intentional. I don't want to essentialize or exceptionalize this community as a population or an object of study. Instead, I'm really trying to stress how, how focusing on how we do research with these communities can and other sets of marginalized communities and honoring their diversity. We can learn about ourselves as researchers or as budding scholars um, and more about the U.S. University as a settler colonial institution. Aha. So I've organized today's talk in four broad touchstones. I'll begin by introducing uh, what brought me to this project and then reviewing, for those who may be familiar, a specific indigenous framework of refusal or refusing research. I'll then move on to talking about how I put that work into practice in what we've done so far in the research project, and then I'll give some anticipated early findings of what I'm seeing so far and what I think I'll find in the future. Um, and yeah, and as I said, there'll be plenty of time for questions towards the end or throughout. So you may ask what brought me to this work, uh, quite literally, queer and trans six visibilizing themselves. So here are a few screen captures, or screenshots as they're also known, um, about five, um, five different Instagram accounts in which individuals in Sikh and Southern Asian communities are trying to make themselves known or be recognized. Though they're not all exclusively located in the US, as you can tell from the screen, uh, we, they have a lot of different formats. We have a podcast and a film based in Vancouver. We have uh, an organization based, uh, a film that based in Punjab, um, a marriage equality initiative going on within the faith led by primarily non-Southern Asian heritage converts to the faith, and also a narrative film that's based in the US. What was striking to me about this, the examples I'm showing here is not just the variety and the location that this is happening in, but also the different languages of recognition that you may see in the captions. For instance, South Asian, LGBTQIA6, six, six, and brown. Part of us as scholars of colonialism and race, we attribute this to different processes of racialization and colonization uh, between, the, between Canada, the US, and Punjab. But I think what's important here is that those phrases are all legible to people in this room, which means that these are frameworks that are legible to a Western transnational audience. So here are some sick platforms based in the US, some these ones actually I'm all affiliated with, uh, and the, who have been producing literature, discourse, and debate on current events in the US uh, and how they're affecting queer and trans six. So as you can see from these images, there's conversations around um, experiences of violence in Florida through legislation. There's experiences about silencing and other trauma experienced in houses of worship. And there's also conversations here about casteism within the US. So what we're seeing is that folks are using potentially the language that's available to them where they live to make themselves legible. And at the same time, they're engaging with advocacy issues that are specific to the US, but also drawing ties to a global diasporic community. Here is a small list of some more platforms uh, that I've been following over the years that are either actively or passively engaging with queer or trans inclusion um, or recognition. An organization here, just so you all may not realize it, um, are based, one of them is based in the UK, but does a lot of work between Punjab and the UK. Another, and the other ones are all based um, in the US. So what I'm interested in about here is that the language of six and Sikhi are far more evident and they're foregrounded here, and at the same time, much more use of language around queer and LGBT, LGBT are foregrounded in other instances. So as someone who's interested in this kind of stuff, as a process of visibility for purposes of recognition and inclusion, I find this so fascinating because um, despite the immense differences, I'm gonna argue that there is a through line that you can see. We have community-based Sikh 
or community-oriented Sikh collectives that are asking individuals from LGBTQA and Sikh backgrounds to share their experiences and advocacy. And we also have discussions occurring across a lot of different types of artistic platforms. So I listed some here, podcasts, movies, policy advocacy, and testimonials. So for me, the through line in all of this is that in the diversity recognition efforts is that queer and trans six are storytelling their life histories. And that's important because while the specific purpose of sharing these stories may be different, six are using their personal experiences as sites of expertise in order to demand change, recognition, and inclusion. Critically, many of them are also using Sikhi as a framework in itself in order to make these claims. So in light of these differences uh, in how and what people are doing and using their life histories and Sikhi, for me as a researcher, my question is how can we understand these developing subjectivities? Or another way of thinking about subjectivities is ways that we understand and define ourselves. And how does that connect with ideas of inclusion and recognition? Are six using what's available to them, like I suggested earlier? Uh, are they seeking alternative languages or creating new ones entirely? Are they drawing on communal or cultural histories in order to make their claims like other folks within the faith also do? So if they're sharing their life histories for a purpose and we don't know what that purpose is, it's also important to think about how they're telling it. What are their storytelling practices? So as I began forming this research question, I realized that my method and methodology, which you may have heard about in your classes or when you read about research papers, for me, they have to be really intentionally created in order to do any sort of ethical decolonial research. And because I really wanted to pay attention to the diversity of experiences, that also meant the way that I was doing this research had to be specifically adapted to that. So one way of putting that is that I refused or did not want to simply collect stories of pain which is something that scholars of gender and sexuality often critique the social sciences for doing, is that you just collect a lot of stories of pain and that becomes how we understand these specific communities. I desire to create something else. Similarly, since queer and trans six were using Sikhi in interesting, creative, and what some would call new ways, um, I wanted to understand what Sikhi meant to folks outside of the colonial framing of a religion. So I did not want, or again refused, as I put on the screen, to begin with Sikhi understood as a religion, and I wanted a more open, historically informed understanding and framing of Sikhi. So I settled on thinking of it as an indigenous faith tradition that has undergone numerous processes of transformation, appropriation, and reconstruction since its construction in the 1400s. So as I grounded myself in this sort of framing and literature, what I realized is that there's a lot of research done by and with indigenous communities within the North American context, and it's really relevant. They have an entire methodology of um, these scholars of refusing research or a methodology of refusal, so a way that you approach data and the way that you do work. And in particular, for those of you who have read this maybe in other contexts, this is the framework by scholars um, Simpson, Tuck, and Yang, and I'll talk about it in a little bit as well. But the big key role is that instead of being these like floaty researchers, what they really say is that you're able to do your work because you're connected to a settler colonial university, and that's how this work is able to get done. So to me, this methodology of refusal, in addition to all of this insight, also provided me three specific things for what I was interested in. It was a way of honoring the diversity of experiences between, among and between queer and trans sex. It was a way for me not to avoid or evade the fact that I can do this work because I'm affiliated with a research university. And it helped me actually ask and think about questions of what settler colonialism looks like for someone like me. And in migrant and migrant descendant communities. So I developed two research questions. So for those of you who have probably had the research presentations, you know the research questions are what guide what we do. So if what you've heard semi-structured interviews or surveys, you probably have done those in some way, shape, or form, could be considered extractive, then perhaps oral history as a method could provide something different and provide a different experience for the people that we actually talk with. Or, put it bluntly, um, how does oral history provide decolonial and anti-colonial opportunities of refusing research by enabling individuals to tell, story tell their life histories, displacement, and settlement? Especially given the importance of oral storytelling and in an oral tradition within Sikhi, for those of you that have heard of Janam Sakhis before, the possibility of using oral history opened up a whole bunch of other doors as well. 
A second question, which is something that researchers are really interested about, but lately, if you've been paying attention to the news, have been like forefront, but they don't talk about it this way, it's called a historiographical question. So how do we talk and study history? So for me, the question was, how do I think about the languages of recognition that people are using in the context of the US's, in its colonial context of gender, sexuality, and faith? Or, what are the means by which individuals understand their subjectivity in relation to faith and intergenerational colonialism and settler colonial settlement in California? What languages are they developing to describe their lives and in what ways does that reflect or challenge the history of gender, sexuality, and faith that we sort of have in our US imaginary? So, with these questions framed in this way, I think it's helpful for me to review what I mean by refusal of research, because it's easy to just say, we refuse it, aha, and then say, I desire something else, aha. So I figured it would be helpful to talk about that and then also give you an understanding of what oral history means as a method. So, for those who may be familiar, this is gonna be the most like lectury portion of this talk, so just FYI if you need to grab coffee or anything like that. So. Scholars Tuck and Yang offered three main critiques of social scientific research. One is that subaltern subjects are only able to be named or speak for themselves if they're narrating pain. Processes or experiences of the mundane, joy, and sovereignty are made illegible. This is most clearly seen if you've read any sort of disparities-oriented research that focuses on demographic background, where the fault usually ends up becoming the people who experience the harm are the cause of the harm. And it's outside of those explanations, there's no conversation about like, what is the history or institutional process that made it so this harm could even exist in the first place? Two, oops, two. Uh, Tuck and Yang also asked, what knowledges do universities actually deserve, or in conversation, conversations with my friends, I usually ask this, like, why does everyone get access to our queer secrets? Some things maybe shouldn't be part of the university. So this critique is uh, lodged at the university because the academy is an institution that does four things, which you all might be familiar with. It stockpiles evidences of injustice, but makes no commitment to any sort of social justice. Um, it claims neutrality and universality, but does the work of a nation state. It extracts from informants, but then keeps all the intellectual and financial capital for itself. And then it claims to be inherently limitless, while also at the same time uh, denying and absorbing competing knowledge systems. So we as researchers are just one set of people who make this happen, but because I am a researcher, that is what I bring attention to. Finally, Tuck and Yang also argue that the underlying assumption of social scientific research is that the research itself can lead to change. In other words, if we research the people or in communities who are being harmed or are marginalized, then doing the research, the research itself, the findings, is what will lead to change because the people will change. Instead, what Tuck and Yang offer is that rather than presume that the researched peoples or communities are the problem, maybe research isn't the answer or the intervention that's needed. Instead, our job as researchers might be to recognize the limitations that we have as researchers and try not to place our way of work and research at the top of all ways of doing research or just doing knowledge production in general very clearly here. So those were the three critiques, but then critiques lead to problems. So what are the, the problems, so to speak? So the first one is that by collecting pain for the sake of collecting pain, it operates as a double erasure because research can eradicate, quote, the communities that are supposedly injured and supplant them with hopeful stories of progress into a better, wider world, end quote. Similarly, because researchers operate from a place in which the university's knowledge is presumed to be limitless, um, researchers often overlook how the university is settler colonial and quote already domesticates um, yeah, oh, it's not on the slide. okay already domesticates um, denies and dominates other forms of knowledge end quote and as a result researchers have to be mindful of how their established ways of doing knowledge quote are basically acquiring claiming absorbing and consuming end quote Instead, alternative forms of knowledge, such as connections between art and research, have the potential but not the guarantee to create something else to do otherwise. So to challenge these three problems, what folks put forth 
is that researchers can develop a methodology of refusal that will look different for different research projects. But basically, the way that you move forward with it is that you acknowledge the double erasure that occurs, you flip the gaze, oops, you flip the gaze of the university being limitless, and you engage creative ways of knowledge production, whether it's through art or other forms. Uh, yeah, art is very broad, so you could do film, writing, so on and so forth. Therefore, to practice refusal, we can think of the logic of desire, which is what a lot of queer theorists do. Desire can interrupt the settler colonial logics of being extractive and limitless by naming how desire operates in our work and, and our work as researchers. As I said earlier, I didn't want to create something that simply collected a bunch of pain, um, but by naming that desire instead of pretending that it didn't exist, it led me to more productive and rich ways of asking questions and practicing respect for the people that I want to work with. Desire also interrupts the logics of the past and the future because colonial logics presume that colonization was inevitable and will exist for forever. By considering how participants or narrators offer different timelines in their storytelling and in their life histories, the past can be written and rewritten and new unnamed futures can be imagined. So what did I mean when I say oral history? Just to make sure we're all on the same page. That might be helpful to clarify it, and I, if you have questions, we can talk about it more in the Q&A as well. So Baylor's, or Baylor University's Institute for Oral History, for those that are interested in it, is a place to go look, up a, look for things, notes that oral histories are a product, and they preserve a person's life history or eyewitness account of a past experience through a recording or through interviewing, or, and interviewing. Um, and as a community-based oral historian, I use interviews to go beyond just the research questions I have and try to provide information that can answer different types of historical questions so that other people also can use what I do. Part of doing this work means that I seek out people who may not leave a record, like a physical record otherwise, or do not get the opportunity to be asked questions about events or about their lives. In my case, this was the life history of folks who live in California who are from Punjabi, Sikh, queer, and or trans backgrounds. Within the academic context, for those who are interested, we do have academic professional norms around this. So Linda Shopes and Alessandro Portelli, for those who are interested around this, they also add that oral histories might seem a little obvious, they're oral, so they're sound-based. Um, and they also document a dialogue between two individuals in which the narrator's experiences are most important, and the interviewer is helping the narrator tell their story through questions. So oral stories, particularly from non-hegemonic backgrounds or subaltern backgrounds, is what we would in the academy typically call so-called folk stories or folk narratives. In this sense, when people do oral histories among marginalized communities, a single oral history helps us understand one person's life history. But when you put multiple stories together in one space, in an archive or repository, what you actually have is not just multiple stories, but it enables us as researchers to think about how emotions and memory are actually being used across peoples to create social history and identify how people are creating their own identities and also their communal identities. In other words, as Portelli has said, quote, oral history refers to what the source or the narrator and the historian or the interviewer do together the moment of their encounter in the interview, end quote. Or as Shopes has noted, um, quote, the voice of the narrator literally contends with that of the historian for control. If any of you have done any sort of interview or if you've been in any sort of like question-based you know, you could do like a meeting with a professor, and you're trying to figure out who gets to ask questions or anything like that. In this situation with oral history, the power is all in the narrator's hands to determine where things go. In other words, recounting the experiences of everyday life and making sense of that experience, narrators turn history inside out, demanding to be understood as purposeful agents in the past in talking about their ways that in their life in ways that don't fit into pre-existing categories. So this foundation makes oral histories really ideal for the type of work that I was saying earlier on, because what it does is it says that oral histories are inherently sensorial, they play with our senses, they're relational, it's not one way, it's multiple ways, they're co-constructed, because it takes multiple actors, and power is very clearly at the forefront of what's going on. And if you're analyzing these, then you have to take all these things into account. So what did it look like now with that foundation to actually put this into practice, which is probably what you're most interested in. 
So for today's talk, I'll talk about this in three different ways. Choice of site and partnership, choice of RAs and approach to training, and choice, what I'm calling ethical storytelling, respecting discretion, and story stewardship. So this might be something helpful for those of you who are thinking of doing research as like a practice, or those of you who are already doing research, thinking about maybe opportunities of how to do things a little differently. Okay, hopping right into it. So when it came to my choice of site and partnership, I chose California. Uh, this was partly because California has a large population of six, but it's also because I was born and raised in California. Uh, and I thought when I'm thinking about settler colonialism, it made most sense and appropriate for me to speak and to research in a context in which I had familiarity in which I was implicated, rather than being an outsider to a new community and coming in and trying to understand it. My choice of partner, which I know here, um, is called Chicago Movement. Uh, Yes, they're a grassroots and community-based organization that engages in youth empowerment and community organizing. I'm reading what the caption says in case for those of you want to follow along. Um, in various issues of social justice around health, labor, redistricting, and housing. And I'll list this on the slide as we go along. But there are many issues and potentials and tensions with working with a community partner. Um, for those of you who are more interested in this, I have, I'm happy to share recommendations. So, Jagada for me was helpful because they provided bureaucratic support through grant funding, which meant that I was able to not rely on the university, which is not necessarily trusted by community members who may, whose stories I may want to document. Furthermore, because I was born in California and Jagada has a presence in California amongst the communities, it opened some doors while also closing others. Uh, I have been involved in Jakarta as a volunteer, as a participant, uh, as a guest speaker, and things of that sort, which I think is important to name, because it helped them actually trust me as a collaborator and as a researcher, which is something that often researchers don't do the effort to create those types of relationships. But at the same time, it also meant that I had to be very, very, very cautious about what I presumed because we have an established relationship. So I had to question everything related to the norms of Sikhi, Californianness, casteism, class, Punjabiness, just to name a few. But because I was interested in trying to get at the diversity of experiences among queer and trans sex, I saw this as more of a welcome and uh, something that was good to do as opposed to a hurdle in my work. I also entered into the project knowing that I had to build relationships rather than take them for granted and feel entitled to anyone's story. So as the director and I talked about at one point, people come to his organization to ask them to field surveys because it's hard to actually access these communities. And he asks that they actually just give a presentation of the findings afterwards, and they always say no. So I have said yes, and I'm actually going to send them this recording afterwards too. Um, so that's just a little bit of a snapshot of like what comes up when people try to do this work. And at the same time, this working with Jakarta was helpful because so far it's the only organization in the US that's hosted a Sikh Pride panel, which means that within the community, even if people don't have positive or strong relationship with Jakarta, they had at least a familiarity that this is a org that's doing a thing. Uh, and also, if they grew up in California, they have heard of Jakarta's network in high schools and colleges and in uh, Gurdwara's or in our houses of worship. And finally, maybe most critically in some sense, because Jakarta had a lot of community and cultural capital built up as an organization, it meant that it's able to take so-called risks on issues that are considered taboo within the community and still be able to continue without losing their like, financial supports. And for me, that was really important. So I had to lean into the fact that I could use some established relationships, but I also had to create new ones. Uh, and I had to navigate the tensions of already pre-existing relationships at the same time in order to create trust with the participants I wanted to interview. Which is what that bullet just said. Cool. So on the second dimension of what I said I would talk about, of how desire and refusal popped up in this work, I wanted to create the project with my RAs. I didn't want this to be something that I just dictated to them. I had responsibility to manage the project, but I wanted to include as many experiences as possible, and I knew that my experiences were not the norm by any means. And I thought engaging and training my RAs was an important way of doing this. So on top of that, there's also very few spaces in which queerness, transness, Sikhi, and settler colonialism are centered as ways of understanding knowledge. So training my RAs was an opportunity to actually create a space for that new type of journey. This began by doing an open call that I focused more on the community-oriented as opposed to academic-oriented networks that Jakarta used and I used as well. 
Um, even though the applicants were basically all college educated in some way, they all spoke about the rarity of such a project, the opportunity for receiving this type of training, and the possibility of being able to do this type of work. So I ultimately hired two RAs who were paid, uh, but in an effort to share more of this knowledge outside the bounds of the university. Anyone I interviewed, I offered them to join the training as well. Even though only two ended up joining the training, uh, they said that they joined uh, and while being unpaid to join because they wanted to experience the type of community that the training was offering. I'll discuss what that training means in a little bit, uh, but bear with me because first I want to give you an idea of how refusal and desire popped up in creating the training. So I desire to create my RAs in anti-colonial, decolonial, and queer training on queerness, transness, and sicky because our life experiences could be very, very different and I didn't want to presume we had a shared foundation and I would rather spend the time in creating that foundation. My RAs also came from many of the same marginalized backgrounds that I hoped to include in the project through oral histories, which meant that I, as a queer and trans scholar and sick, was also training other marginalized gender and sexually marginalized six. So that's something that neither I nor my RAs had ever experienced before. So in some sense, by refusing research, I was actually able to access an unnamed desire. And while I've been talking a ton about the potentials of doing this work, there's also some tensions, because when it came to the project itself and trying to respect the vast diversity of experiences, leading a training also meant that I had a lot of agency and I had to be very intentional about how I was doing this. And in the context of settler colonialism, when and how was I actually perpetuating or recreating these norms? For instance, we, as we brainstormed questions that could be asked as part of the oral histories, we had to keep on asking, is that actually an ethical question to ask? Were we simply extracting information so that we could know more and so that we could document it? What were examples of trainings or readings that I could give to my RAs that would help them break the socialization and the untaken for granted assumptions that they have that they've gotten through education here in the US? So what I settled on what was a really helpful example was Christy Dotson's 2018 paper um, on the way to decolonization in a settler colony, reintroducing black feminist identity politics. The paper provided both a critique and a personal solution that was relevant to the work that we were doing because it focused on asking people about their origin stories. So this was helpful because rather than thinking about what questions we could ask to get these little granular insights into people's lives, instead we started asking about what question can we ask that makes people comfortable to share their origin stories, whether it's in relation to their gender, sexuality, their faith, or anything else that might be relevant to their lives. A final tension was that we, as a researcher, this might not be something that everyone here is familiar with, but we do have an ethics board that we have to submit our research to, who then tells us whether it's good, whether it, we can do it or not. Um, oral histories are a little different because people name who they are, uh, so there isn't as much of a same issue with privacy as with other studies. But as you can imagine, if people are afraid of actually um, coming out and <clears throat> naming their identities, that same worry actually still exists, even if they're oral histories. So <clears throat> even though the IRB ended up being a very positive experience, what it basically helped us do was make sure that we were actually living up to the expectations that we had. Okay, now about the training itself, which if you're interested, I'm happy to talk about this in the Q&A as well, but I wanted to give you some very broad strokes because I've mentioned it so many times. So as you can see, this was the title of, in a short description, I was pretty upfront about what I wanted my RAs to learn, but only two of them were academics, and even if they were academics, that did not necessarily mean that we all understood these words in the same way. So, that really came across in terms of designing uh, the training course uh, to help us ask questions and also eventually create the public digital archive that we want to do. What was so key to our ethical approach was being mindful of respecting discretion of what narrators wanted to share and also trying to reach individuals who wanted to share things but maybe were comfortable pub being public about it. So my RAs put it so, one of my RAs put it so eloquently of, how do we reach the people who would want to share their stories but do not, want, but do not feel like they can reach us? How do we include them and their experiences for others if not for the project? So we haven't built the website yet, but these are the type of questions that are on our minds. And instead of just hopping into it and trying to outreach and interview people, we, I made a decision that we have to do oral histories of ourselves. 
So the research team has to go through the process of doing an oral history to actually experience the intimacy and vulnerability that we're asking other people to go through, and those interviews will also be shared on the website. My goal here was that even, and even as we've been doing it, it's been really interesting and revealing to see that like, they crafted these questions, but it's interesting, like, the, where they draw the line of what's okay to share versus when they want discretion has been very interesting to me, because I'm the most open of the group, so I'm just like, sure, we can ask anything we want. And they're like, wait, no, we have to draw this line here. And I was like, interesting, you wrote that question, good to know. Uh, so my goal of this is by doing the round of interviewing, it brought the work back very to a personal place, um, and into that intimate place of partial knowledge as opposed to a universal experience. This led to a second set of potentials, in which we could use the project to intentionally surface hierarchies of power through surveys and questions such as caste locations, class, education, and labor. So this is something that requires a lot of care for folks who may not be familiar with the caste activism in the US and more broadly. Um, a lot of it is focusing on, how do I remove, just read from here. Um, Reveal dominant caste backgrounds and how many knowledge and how many knowledge institutions reflect the stories of people from such dominant backgrounds. Uh, but it's not the same thing to ask someone from a marginalized caste background what their caste background is, especially if the researchers are themselves from dominant caste backgrounds. So while today's politics around anti-casteism uh, has a dimension of reclaiming one's caste identity uh, if you're from a marginalized background, it's not something that's universal. And since we're talking to people across gender and age backgrounds, we actually have to be really careful and thoughtful about how these politics play out across generations. So we settled on asking two questions in the post-interview um, through a survey. One was, how would you describe your race or racialized identity in terms of the United States' history? We gave examples like South Asian, Memsa, Punjabi, and Asian Californian, Desi, etc. We also asked them, which heritage do you or your family claim? A, for example, a state, area, a bend or village, historic cultural group, or clan. Finally, as this last example shows, doo -doo -doo -doo, our, as this last example shows, our final tension was that we needed to be mindful that our ethics, even though they were grounded in a politics of care and healing, they're not comprehensive to everyone. So we focus, this, focus on this a lot in our trainings in thinking about what does ethical storytelling actually mean and what is our role in trying to do that. Awesome, so the final part. So to make our practices on this third dimension very, very clear for folks, because sometimes we academics have a habit of talking very abstractly, and then we don't talk about the actual practices that we do, uh, I wanted to lay them out here. So we, for the interviews, we standardize a pre-interview or a check-in that's compensated before we do the formal interview that's also compensated. The goal was to really enable the narrator to set the terms of the storytelling that they felt comfortable with and to let them know and remind them that this isn't us trying to get information out of them, but this is about creating a space for them to reflect and imagine. Through the, the, the interviews, our oral histories, we prepared a bunch of bucket questions that I mentioned earlier to help narrate those stories. These included questions on temporal development, such as moving from childhood to adolescence to adulthood to elderly status, identity formation with respect to queerness, Sikhi and transness, and also geography and settlement with respect to California, uh, the US, and Punjab, and does art wherever else their family may be coming from. And finally, desire, intimacy, and dreaming with respect to like what they desire in life, what type of relationships they've built, they'd like to build, who they're close with, what types of futures they see for themselves. And as we also noted in our IRB application, which I list over here as well, we let the narrators decide when they want to turn on and off the recorder. They also get to review the interviews before we finalize them for public, uh, public website and cut things that maybe they don't want there. And finally, even if they agree to put it on, maybe a month or a year later, they decide that they don't want it there anymore, they have full authority to ask us to take it down. So for us, all these efforts were to center care, ethics, and desire, and that's what we tried to do, and even in our own like guidelines that we created and trying to update them regularly. Okay. So bringing this all back to the research question I shared at the beginning, I wanted to re-emphasize how using refusal and desire as ways of producing knowledge can open up a bunch of different types of possibilities. So 
I'll go through this a little quicker because you all may not be as interested in my research questions as other audiences would be. Uh, I was asking basically how is it that oral history can provide other ways of refusing research, which I'm referring to as decolonial and anti-colonial, and what are the different ways of, or different languages of recognition that people are using, and in particular, queer and trans six, how are they thinking about themselves as part of this national narrative around inclusion and recognition? Or, to put it bluntly, what stories do queer and trans six tell of themselves, their communities, and their futures, and how do they do it? So, with refusal orienting the project and desire as a framework to interpret what we find, what I found was that I was using desire at every stage throughout the project to imagine something elsewhere, something different. So through that methodology and using oral histories, I can share just some initial findings that I expect, that what I found but also expect to have soon. Uh, with respect to your logic of desire, Sikhi, the faith-based framework, it emerges as a framework not just for recognition, it, for recognition and not just one for constriction. Uh, instead, what I see is a lot of folks are making distinction, distinctions between Sikhi and six um, is a way to not only reclaim a liberating aspect of the faith, but also to give Sikhi and six more nuance and more uh, attention to how things have changed over time. For instance, Sikh divine poetry is written in dogs, or an embodied form of musical meter, and Gurbani and Shabbat's then for folks served as a way for queer and, tra queer and trans six to, who felt distant from six to actually find safety in Sikhi. So Sikhi also provided an opportunity to name and discuss material existence given what the faith is so focused on, such as colonial displacement experienced by Sikhs historically and in the contemporary, but it also gave them language to name and discuss settler colonialism and experiences it, with it in the US. I don't think all Sikhs, all queer or trans Sikhs have this approach. Some may actually very well adopt a constrictive way of understanding the faith and themselves, but my thinking here is that we're going to see a diversity of embodied practices um, among queer and trans sex, and particularly I'm interested in what is the embodied understanding of transness through Sikhi um, in this material world, since I've already seen it in conversation so far. In terms of historical time, which I mentioned earlier, what oral histories are providing is an opportunity of self-authorship. For a lot of queer and trans folks of any background, they're their, their lives are narrated for them, which is maybe not an experience unique to them, but it's something that's very central to how uh, we understand ourselves. Oral history provides them the opportunity to flip them. This also helps surfaces, uh, this helps to surface histories of rule, and since displacement is not always evenly experienced within Sikh diasporas within and between them. Within California itself, for instance, I can already tell you that there are differences in waves of migration between folks who came with high status work visas, with familial sponsorship, refugee versus asylum seeking status, and more recently, um, exploitative migrant work sponsorships, and also access to college training. Finally, uh, and what I'm most excited about once we finish the project in this phase, um, is that oral history provides narrators an opportunity to think beyond the present and consider desire as hopes, aspirations, and possible futures or using a Punjabi word, which I have up here, is that identifies narrators umita for self and for community. As one RA mentioned it when I was facilitating conversation around what type of questions we can ask, they noted that that was actually the first time they've actually had a chance to think about these types of questions and topics. So as queer and trans pasts and presents are colonized into erasure, or so they try, increasingly, once again, our futures, our hope, my hope for the oral history project is not to reclaim but to create unnamed, unfelt, and unknowable futures. And as it pertains to the question about languages of recognition, my sense is that folks will use what's available them to, to them, but also be really creative in what they end up using at the end of the day. Some may use it to fight historic and structural oppressions, and others may still see the faith as a site of violence for themselves and not engage. But our hope is that by bringing these conversations into one place, where usually one dominates over the other, what we'll actually get is be able to ask, like, what does recognition do? What does inclusion do? Where is the desire for this coming from? In other words, we can name the role of colonialism and settler colonialism in how queer and trans six understand themselves, but also refuse to limit themselves and their futures by these terms, by desiring otherwise. So 
Finally, to, these are just examples of different oral histories for those who are interested in what oral history like on a digital platform looks like. This is what I shared with my RAs, but it's also the different uh, oral histories that I was looking at while we were trying to decide what this project should be. We're continuing our bi-weekly check-ins, um, and actually uh, next week we'll be talking about the Pop-Up Museum of Queer History by Hugh Ryan in order to try and figure out what do we actually want this platform to look like. Finally, we also hope that the archive will be able to be used for a lot of institution building. What we mean by that is that we hope to create community-based and culturally informed resources based on what narrators share with us about their experiences and knowledge. Similarly, and more related to folks who might be familiar with the Southern Nation context um, and to the research project, I'm hoping that it provides language resources around um, efforts of advocacy and sovereignty. And then also, for those who are familiar with this particular context, there is a very strong urge or desire to have religious spokespeople, but I'm hoping by having all these stories put together, um, we might be able to challenge notions of religious spokespeople for faith-based communities, especially since these spokespeople speak over and for queer and trans six in genocidal terms. Finally, the project began by engaging with indigenous theories of refusal, so I'm hoping that it provides people and researchers an opportunity to think about the connections between indigenous faith traditions, queerness, and transness, um, such as the work by Mark Rifkin, for those who are interested in it. So especially given the, given the violence of colonial white Christianity here in the US, and with the resurgence of such religious activism in fascist policies and politics today.